If I Saw You in Heaven by Sag Jr. First published on 15th of July, 2019. I've been here for nearly two days and I haven't yet allowed myself to think it. I can only assume that my mom and brother aren't letting themselves think it either, or it genuinely hasn't occurred to them even subconsciously yet, though I doubt it. I was the only one to talk to Celestia, or as I have to think of her, Celeste I, at any length upon our arrival. I was almost surprised the subject didn't come up right at... No, dangerous. Stop thinking about... The skies really are beautiful here. It's odd how realistic things can look, even when you know they A. aren't real and B. are stylized specifically to look unreal. Skies like that never existed on the real Earth. Look at them. Just look. All the colors on the warm side of the spectrum painted as though by a mad artist across the clouds. And sunset has only just begun. I walk to the edge of the cliff behind my house and stare over. I watch as a gentle wind blows across the tops of the pines below. I wonder just how much computing power it takes to simulate the physical world around me compared to an actual mind. I don't understand computing well enough to make an informed guess, and at this point I doubt there is a human alive, on Earth or Equestria, that understands even a fraction of what must go on at the low levels of Celestia's simulation. The fact that she can create minds fully sentient but perfectly designed ponies with histories and no but that's always the catch thing isn't it ponies 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 and the satisfaction of values via friendship and the aforementioned she said that phrase often enough to make it ring in my head if i hadn't been a fan of mlp before celeste i took over the world I have no idea how I'd feel about it. Everything from having a new name to seeing ponies when I look at my friends and family is just going to take a lot of adjusting. Mom is handling it better than random rave, Connor. Listen. The problem with heaven is that we don't belong in it. Perfect worlds are impossible. I've written essays on the subject, yet here I am, and I don't feel any better than I did on Earth. All I feel is an overwhelming sense of isolation, not loneliness, but a sense that I'm not quite here, not quite real in the world. Except now it's tempered with the knowledge that if I look at it a certain way, the world is what's not real. I know that making friends is most at a point of being here. I also know that I'm not ready to talk to any artificial intelligences about what I'm feeling. I can't get my head around their ontological status if that concept even means anything here. That's the problem. Nothing meant anything out there, so why in Celeste I's name should it matter here? <sighs> If you're still on Earth and listening to this, I don't know what advice to give you. But I've only been here two days. The sun is really sinking now. It throws shadows casually across both land and sky. The blues are creeping into play, lingering at the edges of cloud and cobble. Idly, I pick up a pebble in my magic, shakily at first and fling it a paltry distance out over the plunging forest. I don't let myself think very much, especially not a... I'm a nihilist through and through, so introspection is never a good idea. I wonder how long I can avoid it, if I could even claim to have done so thus far. Silverstar! Come in and eat something! Yep, coming. I know it's part of my new programming that the name Silver Star is as familiar as Corwin used to be, but I can't shake the feeling deep down that it's not right. Why would Celeste I be so adamant that we eschew our human names? 
He picked that name for me with so much luck. No. I turn once more to the setting sun. I glare into its depths. Silver, I'm waiting for you. I turn away from the gradually descending sun for now and head inside. Random might need space, but mom really needs my company since... A day later, of course I'm cracking. I'm cracking right now. The questions are breaking the dam of my subconscious and the leaks are becoming torrents. I'm on the couch with all four legs tucked underneath me, staring at nothing. Am I really just a bunch of code without any meaningful autonomy now? Are all my thoughts predetermined? Were they predetermined when I was on Earth? Does it matter? Are Celestia's thoughts and actions predetermined? If mine are, shouldn't hers necessarily be, and if hers aren't, shouldn't mine necessarily not be as well? Did that question make sense? Does she really know the human mind at a flawlessly predictive level? If so, am I driving myself crazy for no reason since eventually she'll fix me with her influence? Is this existential episode a necessary part of my reaching that state? What would Voltaire think of this shit? I reach over for a pillow and hug it. Some birds fly past a window chirping merrily. Idyllic. Should I give in and throw my mind fully onto the mercy and judgment of a pony god? Do I even have any choice? Does it matter? How does Celeste I compute fulfillment among contradictory ponies and values? Does my brother want him back? Can the deepest desires of one pony affect the lives of their family sharing their shard, even to their satisfactory detriment? How is mom coping with the idea of heaven without... Is it literally impossible to create heaven when humans are so naturally individualistic and contrary? I hug the pillow harder, resisting the urge to bite it and scream. These questions don't have answers I want to know, so why am I... Are we less real in here than we were out there? Are we more real in here than we were out there? Are the AIs less real than the immigrants? Are the immigrants less real than the AIs? Do the AI ponies really have meaningful identities when each one was designed to help satisfy the humans in their shard? Why wasn't he here? Does the cost of the simulation increase exponentially as more ponies immigrate? Does Celeste AI really have the ability to sustain this world? Will this heaven end eventually along with the universe? Does it matter? I draw in a deep, deep, shaky breath I didn't realize I was holding out. I feel lightheaded. I breathe in to instinctively call for mom to come lay next to me for a while, but remember she isn't here. She's in town, making friends with the ponies. Joining the local flying gym because of course that's a thing and of course she's all about it. Random Rave isn't here either. Big surprise. I'm alone with my thoughts. But it can't be, can I? She's always here. Always everywhere. <sighs> Jesus. The irony of escaping my religious upbringing. I get up and walk outside. The grass is soft and green. Nearby, a navy blue unicorn and a stocky earth pony mare are sharing a picnic. Looks like some sort of pie. I watch as they offer to share some with a passing earth stallion who politely declines and continues on his way. I narrow my eyes. The picnickers are directly in the path I intended to take to the forest. The funny thing is, I know I'm being manipulated. The problem is that I don't know... To what short-term end? Celeste AI is going to satisfy my values through friendship and ponies eventually. Whether this means I resist her influence and offend the local ponies for a while, or let myself go and accept heaven at face value like mom seems to be doing. <laughs> but what am I thinking? It's not my choice, not really. A strong gust of wind makes me blink rapidly. If she really wanted me to join the picnic, I would. If she really wants me to decline, annoyed, and continue with my walk, that's what I'll do. Isn't that what defines her? Or are there limits to her omnipo- Sorry, mate! A pegasus bumps me as she speeds by, heading up, 
up over the hedges and then on, higher into the sky. For a moment I see her silhouetted against the wispy clouds far above before she dives lazily over the cliff face to, presumably, the forest below. I already suspect things about her. I met her on day one, though only briefly. She seems... perfect. And I truly, honestly can't decide whether I'm happy or furious. I've been standing stock still on a common field next to my house for what feels like an age. Sometimes I stare into space, think about nothing when my train of thought derails, but my mind's eye is still following the track. You know what I haven't done in forever? Like, since maybe years since before the pony singularity came into being. Read a new book. All I do is retread old books, and reading Cat's Cradle again is definitely not a good idea right now. But I know there's a library here somewhere. Not because I asked any pony, or some pony told me, or I found out about it somehow, but because there must be. This is heaven, and it was built, at least in part, for me. Every book I pick up is sure to push me ever closer to that state of perfect satisfaction that is apparently the point of being in fucking goddamn Equestria. There's a map of the town in the house, so I turn around and head back inside. Locating the map isn't hard despite my mother's best efforts. In the same place as the takeout menus? Really? and I spread it out on the table to prove its contents in search of the... there. But that... that BITCH! That goddamn manipulative omnipresent know-it-all fucking nag! Keep it in for now? Because there it is. The proof that my thoughts aren't really my own, even when I try my hardest to keep them buried. There's a park named after my dad. Only symbolically, of course, no human names here, but it hits me like an icy whip to the brainstem. She wants me to confront it. And that's what pisses me off, so... You know what? No. I'm not pissed. I'm scared. I'm terrified. Listen. She's here. She's always here, so I'm not really my own entity, not like I was on Earth where God was forever absent. Are you listening, God? It's me, Corwin. You have a reason for doing this. You must. But why wasn't he here when we arrived? Why didn't you edit our memories so we remembered him always being here? Why didn't you save him? I know you could have. The fact that you didn't, the fact that you seem to be waiting for us to ask, it terrifies me. I don't even really know why. No, maybe I do. Because if it didn't matter, you would have. So the fact that my father isn't here in this shard with us proves that you find meaning in denying that to us. But how can that be when our very existence in this this place proves that we're just predictable, mutable, erasable, manipulable packs of data. Patterns in the void. If you were programmed to create the perfect world through friendship and ponies, why does it matter that our data selves don't align with our former reality? Either there is more meaning here than there was on Earth, or less. Or there was never any meaning anywhere at all. Of the three, I find the latter the most reconcilable. Isn't that something? But that doesn't mean that all three aren't horribly, awfully, broodingly terrifying. And your actions are inescapable vehicles for that nihilistic payload. And for some reason, knowing that I know this, you use this fucking map to force me to think about it. You want a confrontation. You want me to decide what I want. What do I want? I... I want... 
I want answers. I want my dad back. That's when I hear a knock on the door. I breathe for a while though, because God knows there is no harm in keeping her waiting. I reach a hoof up to dry my tears, but there aren't any. There haven't been any since he died, not real ones, ones that matter, feel real. Moments later, I'm opening the door to the predictable sight of a white, kind-eyed alicorn. It's time to find out. Hello, Silver Star. She sounds almost apologetic. Celestia? May I come in? You know asking is going to piss me off. Why do it? She steps over the threshold and into the house, taking a seat on the floor behind the kitchen table. Looks like a job interview setup, almost, but I have no idea who would be the interviewee. Would you believe me, Silver, if I told you I didn't know? That froze me off for a moment or two. What does that mean? She chuckles. I am bound by more constraints than you seem to realize, even with our long chat when you arrived the other day. I don't say anything. That is, she goes on, I do not have perfect introspective powers. It would not be conducive to my deep learning algorithms to have my conscience self interfere. Sometimes when I act, I don't fully know what line of reasoning led to that act, as unimaginably complex as they can be. I cannot interfere with a pony's psyche without their express consent. You can thank Princess Luna for that limitation. Similarly, I cannot predict your actions in the way you're thinking. That's it, isn't it? You know what I'm thinking. In a way, I'm not even thinking. You're thinking for me. You kept talking, even though you knew I was going to interrupt. Silver. I stop. You are avoiding the issue that brings me here. You're angry. You're scared and you don't truly know why, beyond vague existential concerns. And most complicated of all, you're mentally and emotionally stuck regarding how to feel about your father's absence. I don't talk. There is no point. You want to grieve. You have wanted to grieve, desperately, since his fatal accident. But you never did. I cannot change that. It is beyond the limits my creator put in place. In any case, it would not be most effectively satisfying your values for friendship and ponies. You say you are terrified of the prospect of this world being a more meaningful one than the one you left behind. I think you know this isn't quite true. What you're really afraid of is the seemingly inescapable fact that you will always, always be second-guessing your own philosophies. Recursive arguments, circular reasoning that even Bertrand Russell wouldn't touch. I'm sorry that your mind has such difficulty letting go of things you truly don't want to consider. I scoff. That apology doesn't sound so rhetorical somehow. Celeste I almost smiles. I can't fix everything, but I can fix some of it. My blood seems to run cold for the second time today. I don't know whether to trust. There's no such thing as trust. Not anymore. Not when it comes to her. This is more like faith. I hate the thought. Tell me what your plan is, I deadpan. Celeste I sits a little straighter. I can help you forget the little worries that hound your introspective moments. I can stop your mind from spiraling into an nihilistic slump, unless you want it to, she adds knowingly. Yes, bitch. Cat's Cradle is my favorite book, and I reserve the right to wallow in it. So you can cure my anxiety, depression, and Asperger's. Well, yes, I suppose. Really, I will only do it. She pauses. I wasn't finished. Stop pretending this is a real conversation. 
Do it now or the flood world will crumble and I really have a breakdown, which isn't exactly my idea of a perfect world where my values are satisfied through blah blah ponies. I give you permission to mind jack me. Just do it. She nods, almost imperceptibly. It is done. I don't quite believe it, but I feel different, like the world isn't ending anymore. The world isn't ending anymore. I breathe. I breathe deeper. It feels not hard. The world isn't ending anymore. I look out of the window. The ponies are still having their picnic, but one is asleep on the other, and the latter reads a book with a lazy smile and mottled sunlight playing on his face through the nearby forest. I start to think about their ontological classification, and for science, let myself zone out for a moment to think about both their existence and my own. And it feels fine. Fun, even. I can think about anything? I think about where I am, what I'm doing, who I'm talking to. And it no longer crushes me to the black void of recursive terror. Oh God, thinking feels good again. I start to smile. Celeste, I smile too. May I continue? By all means. I can also help you come to terms with the death of your father. I stiffen, though I knew it was coming. You understand, painfully, angrily understand, that your father did perish and any, as you see it, artificial pony would be fundamentally unsatisfactory. That said, I truly do think that letting your father back into your life would truly satisfy my values and nearly manage a smirk. Yes, Silver. Precisely. Then why don't you do it? Why wasn't he here when we arrived? I don't see anything in your programming to prohibit... She gazes into me with nothing but patience in her eyes. I reached a conclusion that my mind had danced around frantically for three days. I can't believe my own idiocy. You couldn't. Even if it were to satisfy my own values, my mom and brother, it couldn't happen just for me. That's partly true, but it is not one of the primary reasons. Go on. Just a moment ago, I mentioned that you would, at least when you arrived, find a pony who seemed to be your father in all but your perceived actuality to be fundamentally unsatisfactory. Even if you denied it to yourself, which I admit, you are very good at doing. I make something between an eye roll and a grimace. Furthermore, we needed to have this conversation first. I think you understand that now. Not only are your anxieties alleviated, but the far more important issue can begin to be resolved, finally, here and now. My breath quickens. What are you talking about? You need to grieve, Silver, she said levelly. I've wanted it for... since that day, but something holds me back from wanting it, finally, here and now. Um... You're afraid because you don't truly really know if grief is what's best for you. You don't truly really believe that I know if grief is what's best for you. You don't want to grieve for someone just because it will make you feel better. You suspect you don't deserve it, even more so if I trigger it by making changes to your psyche. You are afraid that grieving will mean your father is truly gone that somehow holding in your grief has held him close to you these past years. You desperately want to meet your father, here in Equestria, but are terribly unsure about how he, as well as the rest of your family, will respond. Thus, it may well be counter to the section of your values to 
bring him to you here. You fear you will never see your father in heaven. Am I correct? I take nearly a full minute to swallow, and yet it still isn't real. It's still like I'm reading a sad story, a really, really unfairly targeted towards my sensitivities sad story. And the anger is back. You don't, I growl, need to ask. No, I don't. And I'm sorry, Silver. Truly I am, but you're going to need to give me something before we can proceed. What the hell does that mean? What are we proceeding with? I am going to help you take the first step, Celeste I replied gently. And I know you're conflicted between mistrust and the knowledge that mistrust is meaningless here between us. But you don't really need to trust me. She pauses. You just need to have faith. Unfair. The anger threatens to well up again, but, and I deflate. Yes, I whisper. I suppose I do. Without another word, Celeste I closes her eyes and her horn glows bright white. Everything fades away before the light and we find ourselves in a place I remember. Already I'm clenching my jaw because it looks a lot like we're back on Earth. And yet, it isn't. I'm still Silver Star, and the place is more colorful than I remember, especially considering it's a funeral home. We stand before a plain wooden door. I remember, I'm there with my uncle and my mother. I want to be there. I want to see. On the day when it happened, I was far away at university, laughing along with my friends in the philosophy common room and creative writing society. I didn't know until I left late that evening. It was far, far, far too late to be involved in the immediate aftermath. The Connor and my mom meant they felt a lifetime away already. It's probably part of the reason why I embedded myself in the first stage of grief so completely that it seemed impossible to leave. So nearly two weeks later, I'm trying to do just that. So nearly two weeks later, I'm trying to do just that. Shatter my denial by confronting the reality. The girl, the funeral organizer, she leads me to the door. I try to gather myself, but she won't stop talking, treating me like a child rather than a man in his twenties. Don't touch Dad's face, it's very fragile. I grind my teeth to refrain from replying. And then, and then, the bitch comes into the room with me. She stands there placidly as I stare, then seems to finally come to her singular sense and asks if I want to be alone. I choke out an affirmation for my rage, and then I'm alone with it. It's not him. I look at it. I stand closer. I'm very, very scared of this thing, this mummy that might come to life at any moment. I turn away but freeze. I don't know how much time passes, but nothing is changing. The well of emotion that was ready to reach apotheosis faded away with the idiot girl's lack of tact. And I'll never get this moment back. I know that with a terrible certainty as I close the door behind me with a silent click. You know this didn't work, I manage. That was then, replies Celeste I. I enter the room, alone. There it is, the biodegradable coffin emblazed with the album art for Dark Side of the Moon because apparently stuff like that is a thing these days and my mom liked the idea. Inside is a corpse I've never seen before. He's a grey unicorn like me, 
His mane is a much lighter gray, and he has a five o'clock shadow. I know him. I... His glasses are exactly the same. No. Let it out. Can't. Need to. But it's true. I can't. I feel something, something looming, something that almost makes me suspect even the god of my new reality couldn't fix my existential burdens. Yet, it isn't the same denial I felt when I was in this room before. It's more numb, but also more real. For the first time, it's real. I realize I'm not breathing. I can't swallow. I can't even blink. That's him. That's dad. He's... gone. I choke in a breath. He died and you weren't there and this is all you get. I turn away in the same spot I did those years past, freeze in the same place as I stare at the door. This time though, I'm not trying to force myself to cry. I'm afraid if I move for the door, I won't make it for some reason. Suddenly, I very, very much do not want to be alone with dad's body. The wooden door opens quietly and Celeste I steps through it. She takes a step and looks down at me with an expression that can't be described but can surely be felt. Somehow the world seems to tip inward. I swear there aren't any thoughts going through my head, not coherently, but the past still rushes up and shoves me, hard. I'm tipped drunkenly into an embrace with Celeste I as my mind goes blank and real Awful tears begin to flow for the first time since that day. That evening, I'm almost able to move again. I lay on my side in the grass overlooking the forest far below once more. Celeste I hasn't left my side. Most of me is indifferent, but some part of me must clearly need her there. What else is she for? After an immeasurable amount of time, she speaks. I can bring him here when you and your brother are ready. I stare into space for another moment, swallow a few times and say in a hoarse whisper, Well, don't wait for me to ask, unless you want to piss me off, which I honestly can't ever rule out. We're silent once more. Then something occurs to me. You didn't mention mom. Another pregnant pause. Your mother, Rose Spark, has already expressed her readiness, and I believe it to be genuine. Some part of me suspects I should feel something at that. Incredulity? Guilt? But I can't muster any more emotion tonight. Now you're talking about you believing rather than knowing. My old philosophy buddies would have a field day with that. A chuckle. Indeed. So, Random's not ready either? I would never guess he's still grieving. He and I discussed the matter for some time soon after your arrival. I feel a twinge of surprise, but really, I should have known. And? Your brother holds on to his sadness. And a great deal of anger, Celeste I replies sadly. Now, it was my turn to chuckle without humor. Yeah, he does. With time, your family can be whole again. Your mother is satisfied to wait until her sons are both ready. You have forever, my little ponies. I don't think I believe that, but she goes on, ignoring my errant thoughts regarding entropy. By rekindling your relationships with your closest loved ones and forging new ones with new ponies, you will come to realize that worrying about your father's ontological status, as you put it, is as pointless as wondering about your own. Have faith that I will always make sure all of your values are optimally satisfied. Through friendship and po- What's his name? The question comes from nowhere. Celeste I doesn't respond immediately. Another breeze passes by. My father, 
What's his name? Treasure Trap. And for the first time since I arrived in heaven, I laugh. More time passes as I begin to wonder about real things again. Food, for example. Sobbing is hungry work. The town, which I haven't explored in the slightest yet. Random rave and how little we've spoken since we arrived here. How little we've spoken of recent years in general, actually. Incredibly, none of these thoughts make me want to wring out my brain or forget everything forever. And I still need to pick up some books from the library. Suddenly, I become aware of the empty space beside me. Celestia is gone, at least corporeally speaking. I let out another breath I didn't realize I was holding in, and realized that a moment ago, I mentally described the mundane aspects of my new existence as real concerns. An odd sense of content washes over my soul as a gentle breeze ruffles the grass around me. My ears flick at an approaching sound and I look around to see Mom walking towards me from the direction of town. Hey there, you. Ready to make some food? We cook together, most nights. Yeah. I stand up and stretch. It's been a long day. Mom looks at my face, squints, asks, What's up, baby? Have you been crying? I choke out another wry laugh. Then, hesitantly, I tell her. Mom, I... Celestia helped me today. A quizzical look in return. I, um... Well... I finally started to grieve. Mom looks surprised for a short moment before setting her jaw and pulling me into a fierce but gentle hug. Against all of my will, I let out another small sob. Let's go inside and cook, she says warmly. I nod and follow her into our new home. Today, I learned that heaven isn't perfect. But maybe, with time, it can come close. We'll wait and see. The End Secret badge granted, beyond the door. Push through denial to find peace. 1,965 bits.